Hey everyone, I'm recording with my mic again, so if the audio sounds different, that's why. So this is Justice League number three, um, part three of the totality storylines, uh, Scott Snyder's first story on Justice League, and it's, at least with this issue, it is kind of running out of steam. The first issue was good, and, you know, it was a, cool to see all the members of the Justice League. That alone made the book worth it. The second book felt more of like a, you know, kind of a set-up book. Um, and then this one seemed like it would be the one where a lot of the action started, but I don't, it, it's not what it was um i guess maybe issue four will do that so yeah this one wasn't as great it was still good but it wasn't as great as the first two um and a lot of it is just because scott snyder his stories are really like, complex and uh you can basically tell a scott snyder story when you read it because usually there's some kind of cosmic force out there that's bringing the doom of the universe with it and if it's not stopped everything is gonna gonna die so that's that's how dark knight's metal was that's how no justice w was and that's how this is kind of turning out to be so it's like one cataclysmic event after the next and it would just be nice just to have you know the the uh good guys go stop like uh the riddler you know the riddler and his gang <laughs> uh robbing a bank or something like that you know just a little bit more uh more simple but maybe we'll get that with the legion of doom i don't know we'll see uh so it starts off with uh sinestro and explaining how he was searching for the invisible spectrum so as i've explained before there's there's a visible spectrum of emotions, and then I guess now there's an invisible one, so... Ah, uh, whatever. Um, but I mean... Just a whole lot of talking, talking, talking. When I... When I read a comic, I kind of want it to be, you know... Um, Fast-paced, and, you know, let's get this going, let's see the action. This was not that. This was just a whole lot of talking. Um... In the last issue, so we ended with uh, John Stewart having become an ultraviolet lantern and attacking the Justice League, um, but thankfully they're able to stop him. Well, I guess Cyborg is. So they're all fighting him and not really doing so great. Um, he can now transform himself into this huge beast, uh, this monster. So that is kind of cool. Uh, the art here is really nice. Jorge is doing a fantastic job, as always. But anyway, Cyborg uh, comes in and blasts him with some, like, sonic sonic power and knocks him out. Um, so yeah, after we see that fight, then we get to Superman and Martian Manhunter. They are inside the totality, which is the entire power of the Source Wall, which is apparently where the multi multiverse started. And it's now here on Earth. And it's, again, very uh, convoluted at this point. Um, so they're fighting these monsters. It doesn't explain what they are, and that's okay. It's just, okay, there's monsters in there. whoop de doo um, And then Batman and uh, Shira. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess her name's Kendra, but... Uh, I think everybody who has seen, who watched the, uh, Justice League TV show is gonna call her Shaira. Uh, Zach from DNC calls her that, I call her that, so, um, I'm calling her Shaira because that's a cooler name than Kendra anyway. No offense to any of you Kendras out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, they are, uh, fighting the, uh, I don't know, the Metagenes mut Mutagen. Mutagen, and I guess if, you know, they 
were left unattended, they would attack the brains of Superman and Martian Manhunter. But thanks to Batman and Shira, uh, or Hawk Girl, they are keeping him off the brain. <laughs> and uh, uh, then we see Lex Luthor is still behind uh, Batman and Superman's body. And then we cut to the Hall of Justice. John is recovering. And so he's explaining to the Justice League what the ultraviolet lanterns are. But he explains it. It just, it's totally an exposition, a narr narration by Scott Snyder. Um,. The Spectrum, its heart, is a living phantom galaxy powered by a sentient black sun called Umbrax. And we don't know really how he... I guess he found out uh, on Zanshi, wherever that was, about this whole Umbrax thing. And so the Umbrax moves unseen through space, drawn through the planets, and is pulled to the primitive outliers. Um... Yada, yada, yada. Sinestro wrote that the invisible spectrum was tied to six other hidden forces of the... So, there's not only the ultraviolet spectrum, now there's six other forces tied with that. Plus whatever this Umbrax thing is, who moves through... who moves unseen through space, drawn toward planets where self-destructive forces... Are. <laughs> it's... So, this was a joke that uh, Zach made. And he said that if these beings have been here for the entire existence of the universe, which, according to this book, is billions of years, even though I don't you know, believe that, but according to this book, it's been billions of years. Why are they just now waiting to do this? When they could have attacked a much more vulnerable Earth, like, um, like millions of years ago, before there were superheroes at all. Before, you know, there were there was any kind of technology whatsoever. What took them so long? Why are they just now getting to Earth? It's just it's okay, whatever. Um, so they're gonna go try to and hunt down this uh, um, force, the Still Force, I guess, which is the opposite of the Speed Force. It used to be Barry Allen was just in a lab accident. Uh, he was struck by lightning while he was bathed in all of these chemicals and that gave him super speed. Then it came it became this whole big story of how the speed force was in the lightning bolt and so he now is part of the speed force and the speed force is this big force out there and now there's a speed force that counters it and blah 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 just get on with the story please <sighs> so then back inside the totality which is apparently huge even though i mean i don't know i i guess judging from the look it's like you know a meteor i don't know how big it's supposed to be but from this perspective it looks huge um like if that, it's probably like the TARDIS type thing where it's bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. Because if something this big, the, if you know, look how big this looks. If something like that hit the Earth, uh, the Earth would be bye bye. So it's got to be bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. Which, however that works, I don't know, but whatever. Um, the realm is changing, it's opening up, so I guess the landscape is changing. Um, and they run into these huge giant things that apparently uh, were the same giant, or they looked like the giants trapped uh, on the source wall that we saw in No Justice. Still doesn't really explain what the heck they are, but... So this is where it got a little annoying. Martian Manhunter, who's supposed to be this completely level-headed, um, very logistic uh, person, is just going to fly up to the huge giants, even when Superman, who tends to be more impulsive than Martian Manhunter, is like, whoa, let's wait, let's just check out, check these things out, make sure we know what this is. 
He's like, no, don't you see their, the, the totality is trying to talk. I know it. I can read their minds. And so he flies up completely bullheadedly, I guess, impulsively. And that's exactly what Lex Luthor wanted, which obviously is a bad thing. And what do you know? <laughs> Superman ad. What do you know? Uh, the thing, whatever, the giant thing, uh, starts attacking Martian Manhunter. Didn't see that one coming. Um, I guess when he touched the, the big giant thing, he saw first like a younger version of himself and a younger version of the giant, and then the giant fight him, I guess, and then showed him an image of the world burning. I, I don't know. So, <laughs> so exactly what we knew was going to happen happened. And then in Atlantis with you know uh, apparently to Aquaman these look like or to Wonder Woman they look like Amazonian designs but Aquaman's like no they're Atlantean designs and I'm like what's the difference? <laughs> it's so generic you can't even tell it's so, out. Who cares? I don't it's, it's, it's the design is the design. They no, don't really make an effort to make it that different so why are you even mentioning it? And then the stupid Barry Allen, who is the worst part of this comic, is like, look guys, a white Martian. But the facial structure, it's more primitive than the ones I've seen before, more animalistic. If you saw something in a tube that looked like a white Martian, you would just say, oh hey, look guys, it's, it looks like a white Martian. <sighs> okay, so, and then yes, the big scary monster that looks something straight out of a horror thriller, guess what? Turns out to be something straight out, out of a horror thriller. <laughs> and it starts attacking the Justice League. And all through this, there's just dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Um, I, at first, I thought it was really cool how Scott Snyder was writing in the, these little narrations because it made it feel like um, an older comic book from like the 70s um, and even 80s. Um, but when he's over explaining every little thing, it just takes away from the flow and it, it, it's a little over explanation. I appreciate the effort that he goes into making sure the readers understand what's going on. But even like sometimes when you over explain something, it just becomes more complicated than it already was. Like if you just say peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know what that is, but it takes a lot longer to do explain okay so you have the bread and then on one side of the bread you put the peanut butter then on well depending on how you make it you put peanut butter on both sides and then you put the jam in the middle and then you put the bread together and then you cut it in half and there, there you go so you see you know it takes a lot longer and you think have to think more instead of just thinking oh yeah peanut butter jelly sandwich let's move on scott snyder gets stuck on making the sandwich so if you could just stick with the sandwich that would be great i hope that analogy made sense uh so then we cut back to the inside of uh, uh john and guess what the joker is there uh which he actually looks really creepy there again i love jorge menez's art but um i guess we'll see how somehow he got in there how he so lex luther infiltrated superman's body Joker got into Martian Manhunter's body. I don't know how, but he did. I guess that'll be explained later. Uh, so then we see the moon, which was destroyed in the first issue. Uh, so somehow, I guess they'll have to figure out a way to rebuild it. But on the moon, somehow it ex escaped destruction was part of the original Watchtower. So originally, the Justice League met in the Hall of Justice. Then they moved to this Watchtower on the moon. And then they moved to the Watchtower satellite, which is what everybody knows from the uh, cartoons. Um, and uh, Sinestro shows up there. So uh, John and Cyborg were looking for... I'm not, I don't even know what they were looking for. Um, I think they're, yeah, they're trying to track the Umbrax thing by, with the tech that's inside the Watchtower. And while they're doing that, Sinestro shows up. Uh, John kind of loses it again. And you remember how it said that 
this that Umbrax, how it hunted down primitive planets. Oh, well, guess what? It came to Earth. Big reveal. He's seeing the truth, Cyborg. What everyone will soon see that the world that drew Umbrax to it was yours. Dun dun dun. See, the invisible spectrum is already here, and Earth just joined its ranks. So what we knew 15 pages in advance, I mean, it, I don't know, you saw this coming. Please tell me you saw this coming. Anybody could have seen this coming. A primitive planet? Yeah. The Earth has only been described like that a hundred gazillion times, even though as far as we know, it's the only life with intelligence on it. Yeah, that sounds pretty primitive to me, but anyway. Next, uh, this solar system ain't big enough for the two of them. Um, I didn't read that in a good accent, but this video is already 16 minutes long, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. So even without reading all the dialogue, trying to explain what was going on within the dialogue took 16 minutes. Um, let's just tone it down a little bit, Scott Snyder. I, I like you as a writer and as a person. You seem like a cool guy. But just, you've explained things enough. Just give us the story now. Give us the action. Give us the Justice League versus Legion of Doom. Uh, so if you could do that, that would be great. So uh, let me know what you guys thought of this issue. Let me know what you thought of the review. Hopefully it was entertaining enough. Um, and uh, I will see you guys in the next next video. Uh, I just, up well, yesterday uploaded my 40th video. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm trying to think of something cool to do for the 50th video. But I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.